Chapter Seventeen of La Barre by Jory Karl Heismans, translated by Keen Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Toward the end of the afternoon, Durtal quit work and went up to the towers of Saint Sulpice. He found Carre in bed in a chamber connecting with the one in which they were in the habit of dining. These rooms were very similar, with their walls of unpapered stone and with their vaulted ceilings. Only the bedroom was darker. The window opened its half-wheel not on the Place Saint-Sulpice, but on the rear of the church, whose roof prevented any light from getting in. This cell was furnished with an iron bed, whose springs shrieked, with two cane chairs, and with a table that had a shabby covering of green beige. On the bare wall was a crucifix of no value, with a dry palm over it. That was all. Carré was sitting up in bed reading, with books and papers piled all around him. His eyes were more watery and his face paler than usual his beard which had not been shaved for several days grew in grey clumps on his hollow cheeks but his poor features were radiant with an affectionate affable smile to durtal's questions he replied it is nothing de hermie gives me permission to get up to-morrow but what a frightful medicine and he showed durtal a potion of which he had to take a teaspoonful every hour what is it he's making you take but the bell-ringer did not know doubtless to spare him the expense de hermie himself always brought the bottle isn't it tiresome lying in bed i should say i am obliged to entrust my bells to an assistant who is no good ah oh, if you heard him ring it makes me shudder it sets my teeth on edge now you mustn't work yourself up said his wife in two days you will be able to ring your bells yourself but he went on complaining you two don't understand my bells are used to being well treated they're like domestic animals those instruments and they obey only their master now they won't harmonize they jangle i can hardly recognize their voices what are you reading asked durtal wishing to change a subject which he judged to be dangerous books about bells ah monsieur durtal i have some inscriptions here of truly rare beauty listen and he opened a worm-bored book listen to this motto printed in raised letters on the bronze robe of the great bell of schaffhausen i call the living i mourn the dead i break the thunder and this other which figured on an old bell in the belfry of ghent my name is roland when i toll there is a fire when i peel there is a tempest in flanders yes durtal agreed there is a certain vigour about that one ah said carre seeming not to have heard the other's remark it's ridiculous now the rich have their names and titles inscribed on the bells which they give to the churches but they have so many qualities and titles that there is no room for a motto truly humility is a forgotten virtue in our day if that were the only forgotten virtue sighed durtal ah replied carre not to be turned from his favourite subject and if this were the only abuse but bells now rust from inactivity the metal is no longer hammer hardened and is not vibrant formerly these magnificent auxiliaries of the ritual sang without cease the canonical hours were sounded matins and laudes before daybreak prime at dawn tierce at nine o'clock sexte at noon nones at three and then vespers and compline now we announce the curate's mass ring three angeluses morning noon and evening occasionally a salute and on certain days launch a few peals for prescribed ceremonies and that's all it's only in the convents where the bells do not sleep for these at least the night officers are kept up you mustn't talk about that said his wife straightening the pillows at his back if you keep working yourself up you'll never get well quite right he said resigned but what would you have i shall still be a man with a grievance whom nothing can pacify and he smiled at his wife who was bringing him a spoonful of the potion to swallow the doorbell rang madame carre went to answer it and a hilarious and red-faced priest entered crying in a great voice it's jacob's ladder that stairway i climbed and climbed and climbed and i'm all out of breath and he sank puffing into an armchair well my friend he said at last coming into the bedroom i learned from the beadle that you were ill and i came to see how you were getting on durtal examined him an irrepressible gaiety exuded from this sanguine smooth-shaven face blue from the razor carre introduced them they exchanged a look of distrust on the priest's side of coldness on durtal's 
durtal felt embarrassed and in the way while the honest pair were effusively and with excessive humility thanking the abbe for coming up to see them it was evident that for this pair who were not ignorant of the sacrileges and scandalous self-indulgences of the clergy an ecclesiastic was a man elect a man so superior that as soon as he arrived nobody else counted durtal took his leave and as he went downstairs he thought that jubilant priest sickens me indeed a gay priest physician or man of letters must have an infamous soul because they are the ones who see clearly into human misery and console it or heal it or depict it if after that they can act the clown they are unspeakable though i'll admit that thoughtless persons deplore the sadness of the novel of observation and its resemblance to the life it represents these people would have it jovial smart highly coloured aiding them in their base selfishness to forget the hag-ridden existences of their brothers truly carre and his wife are peculiar they bow under the paternal despotism of the priests and there are moments when that same despotism must be no joke and revere them and adore them but then these two are simple believers with humble unsmirched souls i don't know the priest who was there but he is rotund and rubicund he shakes in his fat and seems bursting with joy despite the example of saint francis of assisi who was gay spoiling him for me i have difficulty in persuading myself that this abbe is an elevated being it's all right to say that the best thing for him is to be mediocre to ask how if he were otherwise he would make his flock understand him and add that if he really had superior gifts he would be hated by his colleagues and persecuted by his bishop while conversing thus disjointedly with himself durtal had reached the base of the tower he stopped under the porch i intended to stay longer up there thought he it's only half past five i must kill at least half an hour before dinner the weather was almost mild the clouds had been swept away he lighted a cigarette and strolled about the square musing looking up he hunted for the bell ringer's window and recognized it of the windows which opened over the portico it alone had a curtain what an abominable construction he thought contemplating the church think that cube flanked by two towers presumes to invite comparison with the facade of notre dame what a jumble he continued examining the details from the foundation to the first story are ionic columns with volutes then from the base of the tower to the summit are corinthian columns with acanthus leaves what significance can this salmagundi of pagan orders have on a christian church and as a rebuke to the over-ornamented bell tower there stands the other tower unfinished looking like an abandoned grain elevator but the less hideous of the two at that and it took five or six architects to erect this indigent heap of stones yet servandoni and opanor and their ilk were the real major prophets the zekiels of building their work is the work of seers looking beyond the eighteenth century to the day of transportation by steam for saint sulpice is not a church it's a railway station and the interior of the edifice is not more religious nor artistic than the exterior the only thing in it that pleases me is good carré's aerial cave then he looked about him this square is very ugly but how provincial and homelike it is surely nothing could equal the hideousness of that seminary which exhales the rancid frozen odour of a hospital the fountain with its polygonal basins its saucepan urns its lion-headed spouts its niches with prelates in them is no masterpiece neither is the city hall whose administrative style is a cinder in the eye but on this square as in the neighbouring streets servandoni carancière and ferrou one respires an atmosphere compounded of benign silence and mild humidity you think of a clothes press that hasn't been open for years and somehow of incense this square is in perfect harmony with the houses in the decayed streets around here with the shops where religious paraphernalia are sold the image and ciborium factories the catholic bookstores with books whose covers are the color of apple seeds macadam nutmeg bluing yes it's dilapidated and quiet the square was then almost deserted a few women were going up the church steps met by mendicants who murmured paternosters as they rattled their tin cups an ecclesiastic carrying under his arm a book bound in black cloth saluted white-eyed women a few dogs were running about children were chasing each other or jumping rope the enormous chocolate-coloured la villette omnibus and the little honey-yellow bus of the auteuil line went past almost empty 
hackmen were standing beside their hacks on the sidewalk or in a group around a comfort station talking there were no crowds no noise and the great trees gave the square the appearance of the silent mall of a little town well said durtal considering the church again i really must go up to the top of the tower some clear day then he shook his head what for a bird's-eye view of paris would have been interesting in the middle ages but now i should see as from a hilltop other heights a network of grey streets the whiter arteries of the boulevards the green plaques of gardens and squares and away in the distance files of houses like lines of dominoes stood up on end the black dots being windows and then the edifices emerging from this jumble of roofs notre dame la sainte chapelle saint severin saint etienne du mont the tour saint jacques are put out of countenance by the deplorable mass of newer edifices and i am not at all eager to contemplate that specimen of the art of the maker of toilet articles which l'opera is nor that bridge arch l'arc de la triomphe nor that hollow chandelier the tour eiffel it's enough to see them separately from the ground as you turn a street corner well i must go and dine for i have an engagement with hyacinthe and i must be back before eight he went to a neighbouring wine shop where the dining room depopulated at six o'clock permitted one to ruminate in tranquillity while eating fairly sanitary food and drinking not too dangerously coloured wines he was thinking of madame chantelouve but more of docre the mystery of this priest haunted him what could be going on in the soul of a man who had had the figure of christ tattooed on his heels the better to trample him what hate the act revealed did docre hate god for not having given him the blessed ecstasies of a saint or more humanly for not having raised him to the highest ecclesiastical dignities evidently the spite of this priest was inordinate and his pride unlimited he seemed not displeased to be an object of terror and loathing for thus he was somebody then for a thorough-paced scoundrel as this man seemed to be what delight to make his enemies languish in slow torment by casting spells on them with perfect impunity and sacrilege carries one out of oneself in furious transports in voluptuous delirium which nothing can equal since the middle ages it has been the coward's crime for human justice does not prosecute it and one can commit it with impunity but it is the most extreme of excesses for a believer and docre believes in christ or he wouldn't hate him so a monster and what ignoble relations he must have had with chanteloup's wife now how shall i make her speak up she gave me quite clearly to understand the other day that she refused to explain herself on this topic meanwhile as i have not intention of submitting to her young girl follies to-night i will tell her that i am not feeling well and that absolute rest and quiet are necessary he did so an hour later when she came in she proposed a cup of tea and when he refused she embraced him and nursed him like a baby then withdrawing a little you work too hard you need some relaxation come now to pass the time you might court me a little because up to now i have done it all no that idea does not amuse him let us try something else shall we play hide and seek with the cat he shrugs his shoulders well since there is nothing to change your grouchy expression let us talk what has become of your friend des hermies nothing in particular and his experiments with matei medicine i don't know whether he continues to prosecute them or not well i see that the conversational possibilities of that topic are exhausted you know your replies are not very encouraging dear but he said everybody sometimes gets so he doesn't answer questions at great length i even know a young woman who becomes excessively laconic when interrogated on a certain subject of a cannon for instance precisely she crossed her legs very coolly that young woman undoubtedly had reasons for keeping still but perhaps that young woman is really eager to oblige the person who cross-examines her perhaps since she last saw him she has gone to a great deal of trouble to satisfy his curiosity look here hyacinthe darling explain yourself he said squeezing her hands an expression of joy on his face if i have made your mouth water so as not to have a grouchy face in front of my eyes i have succeeded remarkably he kept still wondering whether she was making fun of him or whether she really was ready to tell him what he wanted to know listen she said i hold firmly by my decision of the other night i will not permit you to become acquainted with canon d'ocre 
but at a settled time i can arrange without your forming any relations with him to have you be present at the ceremony you most desire to know about the black mass yes within a week docre will have left paris if once in my company you see him you will never see him afterward keep your evenings free all this week when the time comes i will notify you but you may thank me dear because to be useful to you i am disobeying the commands of my confessor whom i dare not see now so i am damning myself he kissed her then seriously that man is really a monster i fear so in any case i would not wish anybody the misfortune of having him for an enemy i should say not if he poisons people by magic as he seems to have done Gévinger. and he probably has i should not like to be in the astrologer's shoes you believe in docre's potency then tell me how does he operate with the blood of mice with broths or with oil so you know about that he does employ these substances in fact he is one of the very few persons who know how to manage them without poisoning themselves it's as dangerous as working with explosives frequently though when attacking defenceless persons he uses simpler recipes he distills extracts of poison and adds sulphuric acid to fester the wound then he dips in this compound the point of a lancet with which he has his victim pricked by a flying spirit or a lava it is ordinary well-known magic that of rosicrucians and tyros durtal burst out laughing but my dear to hear you one would think death could be sent to a distance like a letter well isn't cholera transmitted by letters ask the sanitary corps don't they disinfect all mail in the time of epidemics i don't contradict that but the case is not the same it is too because it is the question of transmission invisibility distance which astonishes you what astonishes me more than that is to hear of the rosicrucians actively satanizing i confess that i had never considered them as anything more than harmless suckers and funereal fakes but all societies are composed of suckers and the wily leaders who exploit them that's the case of the rosicrucians yes their leaders privately attempt crime one does not need to be erudite or intelligent to practice the ritual of spells at any rate and i affirm this there is among them a former man of letters whom i know he lives with a married woman and they pass the time he and she trying to kill the husband by sorcery well it has its advantages over divorce that system has she parted i shan't say another word i think you are making fun of me you don't believe in anything indeed i was not laughing at you i haven't very precise ideas on this subject i admit that at first blush all this seems improbable to say the least but when i think that all the efforts of modern science do but confirm the discoveries of the magic of other days i keep my mouth shut it is true he went on after a silence to cite only one fact that people can no longer laugh at the stories of women being changed into cats in the middle ages recently there was brought to m charcot a little girl who suddenly got down on her hands and knees and ran and jumped around scratching and spitting and arching her back so that metamorphosis is possible no one cannot too often repeat it the truth is that we know nothing and have no right to deny anything but to return to your rosicrucians using purely chemical formulae they get along without sacrilege that is as much as to say that their benefices supposing they know how to prepare them well enough to accomplish their purpose though i doubt that are easy to defeat yet i don't mean to say that this group one member of which is an ordained priest does not make use of contaminated eucharists at need another nice priest but since you are so well informed do you know how spells are conjured away yes and no i know that when the poisons are sealed by sacrilege when the operation is performed by a master docre or one of the princes of magic at rome it is not at all easy nor healthy to attempt to apply an antidote though i have heard of a certain abbe at lyon who practically alone is succeeding right now in these difficult cures dr joannes you know him no but Gévinger, who has gone to seek his medical aid has told me of him well i don't know how he goes about it but i know that spells which are not complicated with sacrilege are usually evaded by the law of return the blow is sent back to him who struck it there are at the present time two churches one in belgium the other in france where when one prays before a statue of the virgin the spell which has been cast on one flies off and goes and strikes one's adversary rats 
one of these churches is at tougres eighteen kilometres from liege and the name of it is notre dame de retour the other is the church of l'epine the thorn a little village near chalon this church was built long ago to conjure away the spells produced with the aid of the thorns which grew in that country and served to pierce images cut in the shape of hearts near chalon said durtal digging in his memory it does seem to me now that des hermies speaking of bewitchment by the blood of white mice pointed out that village as the habitation of certain diabolic circles yes that country in all times has been a hotbed of satanism you are mighty well up on these matters is it docre who transmitted this knowledge to you yes i owe him the little i am able to pass on to you he took a fancy to me and even wanted to make me his pupil i refused and am glad now i did for i am much more wary than i was then of being constantly in a state of mortal sin have you ever attended the black mass yes and i warn you in advance that you will regret having seen such terrible things it is a memory that persists and horrifies even especially when one does not personally take part in the offices he looked at her she was pale and her filmed eyes blinked rapidly it's your own wish she continued you will have no complaint if the spectacle terrifies you or wrings your heart he was almost dumbfounded to see how sad she was and with what difficulty she spoke really this docre where did he come from what did he do formerly how did he happen to become a master satanist i don't know very much about him i know he was a supply priest in paris then confessor of a queen in exile there were terrible stories about him which thanks to his influential patronage were hushed up under the empire he was interned at la trappe then driven out of the priesthood excommunicated by rome i learned in addition that he had been several times accused of poisoning but had always been acquitted because the tribunals had never been able to get any evidence today he lives i don't know how but at ease and he travels a good deal with a woman who serves as voyant to all the world he is a scoundrel but he is learned and perverse and then he is so charming oh he said how changed your eyes and voice are admit that you are in love with him no not now but why should i not tell you that we were mad about each other at one time and now it is over i swear it is we have remained friends and nothing more but then you often went to see him what kind of a place did he have at least it was curious and heterodoxically arranged no it was quite ordinary but very comfortable and clean he had a chemical laboratory and an immense library the only curious book he showed me was an office of the black mass on parchment there were admirable illuminations and the binding was made of the tanned skin of a child who had died unbaptized stamped into the cover in the shape of a fleuron was a great host consecrated in a black mass what did the manuscript say i did not read it they were silent then she took his hands now you are yourself again i knew i should cure you of your bad humour admit that i am awfully good-natured not to have got angry at you got angry what about because it is not very flattering to a woman to be able to entertain a man only by telling him about another one. Oh no it isn't that way at all he said kissing her eyes tenderly let me go now she said very low this enervates me and i must get home it's late she sighed and fled leaving him amazed and wondering in what weird activities the life of that woman had been passed end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of la bar by jory karl heismans translated by keen wallace this librivox recording is in the public domain the day after that on which he had spewed such furious vituperation over the tribunal gilles de ray appeared again before his judges he presented himself with bowed head and clasped hands he had once more jumped from one extreme to the other a few hours had sufficed to break the spirit of the energumen who now declared that he recognized the authority of the magistrates and begged forgiveness for having insulted them they affirmed that for the love of our lord they forgot his imprecations and at his prayer the bishop and the inquisitor revoked the sentence of excommunication which they had passed on him the day before this hearing was in addition taken up with the arraignment of prelati and his accomplices 
then authorized by the ecclesiastical text which says that a confession cannot be regarded as sufficient if it is dubia vaga generalis illativa jocosa the prosecutor asserted that to certify the sincerity of his confessions gilles must be subjected to the canonic question that is to torture the marshal besought the bishop to wait until the next day and claiming the right of confessing immediately to such judges as the tribunal were pleased to designate he swore that he would thereafter repeat his confession before the public and the court jean de malestroit granted this request and the bishop of saint brieuc and pierre de l'hôpital were appointed to hear gilles in his cell when he had finished the recital of his debauches and murders they ordered prelati to be brought to them at sight of him gilles burst into tears and when after the interrogatory preparations were made to conduct the italian back to his dungeon gilles embraced him saying farewell francis my friend we shall never see each other again in this world i pray god to give you good patience and i hope in him that we may meet again in great joy in paradise pray god for me and i shall pray for you and gilles was left alone to meditate on his crimes which he was to confess publicly at the hearing next day that day was the impressive day of the trial the room in which the tribunal sat was crammed and there were multitudes sitting on the stairs standing in the corridors filling the neighbouring courts blocking the streets and lanes from twenty miles around the peasants were come to see the memorable beast whose very name before his capture had served to close the doors those evenings when in universal trembling the women dared not weep aloud this meeting of the tribunal was to be conducted with the most minute observance of all the forms all the assize judges who in a long hearing generally had their places filled by proxies were present the courtroom massive obscure upheld by heavy roman pillars had been rejuvenated the wall ogival threw to cathedral height the arches of its vaulted ceiling which were joined together like the sides of an abbatial mitre in a point the room was lighted by sickly daylight which was filtered through small panes between heavy leads the azure of the ceiling was darkened to navy blue and the golden stars at that height were as the heads of steel pins in the shadows of the vaults appeared the ermine of the ducal arms dimly seen in escutcheons which were like great dice with black dots suddenly the trumpets blared the room was lighted up and the bishops entered their mitres of cloth of gold flamed like the lightning about their necks were brilliant collars with orphreys crusted as were the robes with carbuncles in silent processional the bishops advanced weighted down by their rigid copes which fell in a flare from their shoulders and were like golden bells split in the back in their hands they carried the crozier from which hung the maniple a sort of green veil at each step they glowed like coals blown upon themselves were sufficient to light the room as they reanimated with their jewels the pale sun of a rainy october day and scattered a new lustre to all parts of the room over the mute audience outshone by the shimmer of the orphreys and the stones the costumes of the other judges appeared darker and discordant the black vestments of secular justice the white and black robe of jean blouin the silk simars the red woollen mantles the scarlet chaperons lined with fur seemed faded and common the bishops seated themselves in the front row surrounding jean de malestroit who from a raised seat dominated the court under the escort of the men-at-arms gilles entered he was broken and haggard and had aged twenty years in one night his eyes burned behind seared lids his cheeks shook upon injunction he began the recital of his crimes in a laboured voice choked by tears he recounted his abductions of children his hideous tactics his infernal stimulations his impetuous murders his implacable violations obsessed by the vision of his victims he described their agonies drawn out or hastened their cries the rattle in their throats he confessed to having wallowed in the elastic warmth of their intestines he confessed that he had ripped out their hearts through wounds enlarged and opening like ripe fruit and with the eyes of a somnambulist he looked down at his fingers and shook them as if blood were dripping from them the thunderstruck audience kept a mournful silence which was lacerated suddenly by a few short cries and the attendants at a run carried out fainting women mad with horror he seemed to see nothing to hear nothing 
he continued to tell off the frightful rosary of his crimes then his voice became raucous he was coming to the sepulchral violations and now to the torture of the little children whom he had cajoled in order to cut their throats as he kissed them he divulged every detail the account was so formidable so atrocious that beneath their golden caps the bishops blanched these priests tempered in the fires of confessional these judges who in that time of demonomania and murder had never heard more terrifying confessions these prelates whom no depravity had ever astonished made the sign of the cross and jean de malestroit rose and for very shame veiled the face of the christ then all lowered their heads and without a word they listened the marshal bathed in sweat his face downcast looked now at the crucifix whose invisible head and bristling crown of thorns gave their shapes to the veil he finished his narrative and broke down completely till now he had stood erect speaking as if in a daze recounting to himself aloud the memory of his ineradicable crimes but at the end of the story his forces abandoned him he fell on his knees and shaken by terrific sobs he cried o oh god o oh my redeemer i beseech mercy and pardon then the ferocious and haughty baron the first of his caste no doubt humiliated himself he turned toward the people and said weeping ye the parents of those whom i have so cruelly put to death give ah give me the succour of your pious prayers then in its white splendour the soul of the middle ages burst forth radiant jean de malestroit left his seat and raised the accused who was beating the flagstones with his despairing forehead the judge in de malestroit disappeared the priest alone remained he embraced the sinner who was repenting and lamenting his fault a shudder overran the audience when jean de malestroit with gilles head on his breast said to him pray that the just and rightful wrath of the most high be averted weep that your tears may wash out the blood lust from your being and with one accord everybody in the room knelt down and prayed for the assassin when the orisons were hushed there was an instant of wild terror and commotion driven beyond human limits of horror and pity the crowd tossed and surged the judges of the tribunal silent enervated reconquered themselves with a gesture brushing away his tears the prosecutor arrested the proceedings he said that the crimes were clear and apparent that the proofs were manifest that the court would now in its conscience and soul chastise the culprit and he demanded that the day of passing judgment be fixed the tribunal designated the day after the next and that day the official of the church of nantes jacques de panquedic read in succession the two sentences the first passed by the bishop and the inquisitor for the acts coming under their common jurisdiction began thus the holy name of christ invoked we jean bishop of nantes and brother jean bluin bachelor in our holy scriptures of the order of the preaching friars of nantes and delegate of the inquisitor of heresies for the city and diocese of nantes in session of the tribunal and having before our eyes god alone and after enumerating the crimes it concluded we pronounce decide and declare that thou gilles de Rey, cited unto our tribunal art heinously guilty of heresy apostasy and evocation of demons that for these crimes thou hast incurred the sentence of excommunication and all other penalties determined by the law the second judgment rendered by the bishop alone on the crimes of sodomy sacrilege and violation of the immunities of the church which more particularly concerned his authority ended in the same conclusions and in the pronunciation in almost identical form of the same penalty gilles listened with bowed head to the reading of these judgments when it was over the bishop and the inquisitor said to him will you now that you detest your errors your evocations and your crimes be reincorporated into the church our mother and upon the ardent prayers of the marshal they relieved him of all excommunication and admitted him to participate in the sacraments the justice of god was satisfied the crime was recognized punished but effaced by contrition and penitence only human justice remained the bishop and the inquisitor remanded the culprit to the secular court which holding against him the abductions and the murders pronounced the penalty of death and attainder prelati and the other accomplices were at the same time condemned to be hanged and burned alive 
cry to god mercy said pierre de l'hôpital who presided over the civil hearings and dispose yourself to die in good state with a great repentance for having committed such crimes the recommendation was unnecessary gilles now faced death without fear he hoped humbly avidly in the mercy of the saviour he cried out fervently for the terrestrial expiation the stake to redeem him from the eternal flames after his death far from his chateaus in his dungeon alone he had opened himself and viewed the cloaca which had so long been fed by the residual waters escaped from the abattoirs of tiffauges and marchecoul he had sobbed in despair of ever draining this stagnant pool and thunder smitten by grace in a cry of horror and joy he had suddenly seen his soul overflow and sweep away the dank fen before a torrential current of prayer and ecstasy the butcher of sodom had destroyed himself the companion of jeanne d'arc had reappeared the mystic whose soul poured out to god in bursts of adoration in floods of tears then he thought of his friends and wished that they also might die in a state of grace he asked the bishop of nantes that they might be executed not before nor after him but at the same time he carried his point that he was the most guilty and that he must instruct them in saving their souls and assist them at the moment when they should mount the scaffold jean de malestroit granted the supplication what is curious said durtal interrupting his writing to light a cigarette is that a gentle ring madame chanteloube entered she declared that she could stay only two minutes she had a carriage waiting below to-night she said i will call for you at nine first write me a letter in practically these terms and she handed him a paper he unfolded it and read this declaration i certify that all that i have said and written about the black mass about the priest who celebrated it about the place where i claimed to have witnessed it about the persons alleged to have been there is pure invention i affirm that i imagined all these incidents that in consequence all that i have narrated is false docres he asked studying the handwriting minute pointed twisted aggressive yes and he wants this declaration not dated to be made in the form of a letter from you to a person consulting you on the subject your canon distrusts me of course you write books it doesn't please me infinitely to sign that murmured durtal what if i refuse you will not go to the black mass his curiosity overcame his reluctance he wrote and signed the letter and madame chanteloube put it in her card case and in what street is the ceremony to take place in the rue olivier de serre where is that near the rue de vaugirard a way up is that where docre lives no we are going to a private house which belongs to a lady he knows now if you'll be so good put off your cross-examination to some other time because i am in an awful hurry at nine o'clock don't forget be all ready he had hardly time to kiss her and she was gone well said he i already had data on incubacy and poisoning by spells there remained only the black mass to make me thoroughly acquainted with satanism as it is practised in our day and i am to see it i'll be damned if i thought there were such undercurrents in paris and how circumstances hang together and lead to each other i had to occupy myself with gilles de ray and the diabolism of the middle ages to get contemporary diabolism revealed to me and he thought of docre again what a sharper that priest is among the occultists who maunder today in the universal decomposition of ideas he is the only one who interests me the others the majors the theosophists the cabalists the spiritists the hermetics the rosicrucians remind me when they are not mere thieves of children playing and scuffling in a cellar and if one descend lower yet into the hole in the wall places of the pythonesses clairvoyants and mediums what does one find except agencies of prostitution and gambling all these pretended peddlers of the future are extremely nasty that's the only thing in the occult of which one can be sure des hermies interrupted the course of these reflections by ringing and walking in he came to announce that gévinger had returned and that they were all to dine at carré's the night after next is carré's bronchitis cured yes completely preoccupied with the idea of the black mass durtal could not keep silent he let out the fact that he was to witness the ceremony 
and confronted by des hermies stare of stupefaction he added that he had promised secrecy and that he could not for the present tell him more you're the lucky one said des hermies is it too much to ask you the name of the abbe who is to officiate not at all canon d'ocre ah and the other was silent he was evidently trying to divine by what manipulations his friend had been able to get in touch with the renegade some time ago you told me durtal said that in the middle ages the black mass was said on the naked buttocks of a woman that in the seventeenth century it was celebrated on the abdomen and now i believe that it takes place before an altar as in church indeed it was sometimes celebrated thus at the end of the fifteenth century in biscay it is true that the devil then officiated in person clothed in rent and soiled episcopal habits he gave communion with round pieces of shoe leather for hosts saying this is my body and he gave these disgusting wafers to the faithful to eat after they had kissed his left hand and his breech i hope that you will not be obliged to render such base homage to your canon durtal laughed no i don't think he requires a pretend like that but look here aren't you of the decided opinion that the creatures who so piously infamously follow these officers are a bit mad mad why the cult of the demon is no more insane than that of god one is rotten and the other resplendent that is all by your reckoning all people who worship any god whatever would be demented no the affiliates of satanism are mystics of a vile order but they are mystics now it is highly probable that their exaltations into the extraterrestrial of evil coincide with the rages of their frenzied senses for lechery is the wet nurse of demonism medicine classes rightly or wrongly the hunger for ordure in the unknown categories of neurosis and well it may for nobody knows anything about neuroses except that everybody has them it is quite certain that in this more than in any previous century the nerves quiver at the least shock for instance recall the newspaper accounts of executions of criminals we learn that the executioner goes about his work timidly that he is on the point of fainting that he has nervous prostration when he decapitates a man then compare this nervous wreck with the invincible torturers of the olden time they would thrust your arm into a sleeve of moistened parchment which when set on fire would draw up and in a leisurely fashion reduce your flesh to dust or they would drive wedges into your thighs and split the bones they would crush your thumbs in the thumbscrew or they would singe all the hair off your epidermis with a poker or roll up the skin from your abdomen and leave you with a kind of apron they would drag you at the cart's tail give you the strappado roast you drench you with ignited alcohol and through it all preserve an impassive countenance and tranquil nerves not to be shaken by any cry or plaint only as these exercises were somewhat fatiguing the torturers after the operation were ravenously hungry and required a deal of drink they were sanguinaries of a mental stability not to be shaken while now but to return to your companions in sacrilege this evening if they are not maniacs you will find them doubt it not repulsive lechers observe them closely i am sure that to them the invocation of beelzebub is a prelibation of carnality don't be afraid because lord in this group there won't be any to make you imitate the martyr of whom jacques de voragine speaks in his history of saint paul the eremite you know that legend no well to refresh your soul i will tell you this martyr who was very young was stretched out his hands and feet bound on a bed then a superb specimen of femininity was brought in who tried to force him as he was burning and was about to sin he bit off his tongue and spat it in the face of the woman and thus pain drove out temptation says the good de voragine my heroism would not carry me so far as that i confess but must you go so soon yes i have a pressing engagement what a queer age said durtal conducting him to the door it is just at the moment when positivism is at its zenith that mysticism rises again and the follies of the occult begin oh but it's always been that way the tail ends of all centuries are alike they are always periods of vacillation and uncertainty when materialism is rotten ripe magic takes root this phenomenon reappears every hundred years not to go further back look at the decline of the last century alongside of the rationalists and atheists you find saint germain cagliostro saint martin gabali cazotte the rosicrucian societies the infernal circles as now with that good-bye and good luck yes said durtal closing the door but cagliostro and his ilk 
had a certain audacity and perhaps a little knowledge while the mages of our time what inept fakes end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of la Barre by jory karl heismans translated by keen wallace this librivox recording is in the public domain in a fiacre they went up the rue de vaugirard madame chanteloube was in a shell and spoke not a word durtal looked closely at her when as they passed a street lamp a shaft of light played over her veil a moment then winked out she seemed agitated and nervous beneath her reserve he took her hand she did not withdraw it he could feel the chill of it through her glove and her blonde hair to-night seemed disordered dry and not so fine as usual nearly there but in a low voice full of anguish she said do not speak bored by this taciturn almost hostile tete-a-tete -tete, he began to examine the route through the windows of the cab the street stretched out interminable already deserted so badly paved that at every step the cab springs creaked the lamp-posts were beginning to be further and further apart the cab was approaching the ramparts singular itinerary he murmured troubled by the woman's cold inscrutable reserve abruptly the vehicle turned up a dark street swung around and stopped hyacinthe got out waiting for the cabman to give him his change durtal inspected the lay of the land they were in a sort of blind alley low houses in which there was not a sign of life bordered a lane that had no sidewalk the pavement was like billows turning around when the cab drove away he found himself confronted by a long high wall above which dry leaves rustled in the shadows a little door with a square grating in it was cut into the thick unlighted wall which was seamed with fissures suddenly further away a ray of light shot out of a show window and doubtless attracted by the sound of the cab wheels a man wearing the black apron of a wine shopkeeper lounged through the shop door and spat on the threshold this is the place said madame chanteloube she rang the grating opened she raised her veil a shaft of lantern light struck her full in the face the door opened noiselessly and they penetrated into a garden good evening madame good evening marie in the chapel yes does madame wish me to guide her no thanks the woman with the lantern scrutinized durtal he perceived beneath a hood wisps of grey hair falling in disorder over a wrinkled old face but she did not give him time to examine her and returned to a tent beside the wall serving her as a lodge he followed hyacinthe who traversed the dark lanes between rows of palms to the entrance of a building she opened the doors as if she were quite at home and her heels clicked resolutely on the flagstones be careful she said going through a vestibule there are three steps they came out into a court and stopped before an old house she rang a little man advanced hiding his features and greeted her in an affected sing-song voice she passed saluting him and durtal brushed a fly-blown face the eyes liquid gummy the cheeks plastered with cosmetics the lips painted i have stumbled into a lair of sodomists you didn't tell me that i was to be thrown into such company he said to hyacinthe overtaking her at the turning of a corridor lighted by a lamp did you expect to meet saints here she shrugged her shoulders and opened a door they were in a chapel with a low ceiling crossed by beams gaudily painted with coal tar pigment the windows were hidden by great curtains the walls were cracked and dingy durtal recoiled after a few steps gusts of humid mouldy air and of that indescribable new stove acridity poured out of the registers to mingle with an irritating odour of alkali resin and burnt herbs he was choking his temples throbbing he advanced groping attempting to accustom his eyes to the half darkness the chapel was vaguely lighted by sanctuary lamps suspended from chandeliers of gilded bronze with pink glass pendants hyacinthe made him a sign to sit down then she went over to a group of people sitting on divans in a dark corner rather vexed at being left here away from the centre of activity durtal noticed that there were many women and few men present but his efforts to discover their features were unavailing as here and there a lamp swayed he occasionally caught sight of a junonian brunette then of a smooth-shaven melancholy man 
he observed that the women were not chattering to each other their conversation seemed awed and grave not a laugh not a raised voice was heard but an irresolute furtive whispering unaccompanied by gesture hmm he said to himself it doesn't look as if satan made his faithful happy a choir boy clad in red advanced to the end of the chapel and lighted a stand of candles then the altar became visible it was an ordinary church altar on a tabernacle above which stood an infamous derisive christ the head had been raised and the neck lengthened and wrinkles painted in the cheeks transformed the grieving face to a bestial one twisted into a mean laugh he was naked and where the loincloth should have been there was a virile member projecting from a bush of horsehair in front of the tabernacle the chalice covered with a pall was placed the choir boy folded the altar cloth wiggled his haunches stood tiptoe on one foot and flipped his arms as if to fly away like a cherub on pretext of reaching up to light the black tapers whose odour of coal tar and pitch was now added to the pestilential smell of the stuffy room durtal recognized beneath the red robe the fairy who had guarded the chapel entrance and he understood the role reserved for this man whose sacrilegious nastiness was substituted for the purity of childhood acceptable to the church then another choir boy more hideous yet exhibited himself hollow-chested racked by coughs withered made up with white grease paint and vivid carmine he hobbled about humming he approached the tripods flanking the altar stirred the smouldering incense pots and threw in leaves and chunks of resin durtal was beginning to feel uncomfortable when hyacinthe rejoined him she excused herself for having left him by himself so long invited him to change his place and conducted him to a seat far in the rear behind all the rows of chairs this is a real chapel isn't it he asked yes this house this church the garden that we crossed are the remains of an old ursuline convent for a long time this chapel was used to store hay the house belonged to a livery staple keeper who sold it to that woman and she pointed out a stout brunette of whom durtal before had caught a fleeting glimpse is she married no she is a former nun who was debauched long ago by docre ah and those gentlemen who seem to be hiding in the darkest places they are satanists there is one of them who was a professor in the school of medicine in his home he has an oratorium where he prays to a statue of venus astarte mounted on an altar no i mean it he is getting old and his demoniac orisons increase tenfold his forces which he is using up with creatures of that sort and with a gesture she indicated the choir boys you guarantee the truth of this story you will find it narrated at great length in a religious journal les annales de la sainteté and though his identity was made pretty patent in the article the man did not dare prosecute the editors what's the matter with you she asked looking at him closely i'm strangling the odour from those incense burners is unbearable you will get used to it in a few seconds but what do they burn that smells like that asphalt from the street leaves of henbane datura dried nightshade and myrrh these are perfumes delightful to satan our master she spoke in that changed guttural voice which had been hers at times when in bed with him he looked her squarely in the face she was pale the lips pressed tight the pluvious eyes blinking rapidly here he comes she murmured suddenly while women in front of them scurried about or knelt in front of the chairs preceded by the two choir boys the canon entered wearing a scarlet bonnet from which two buffalo horns of red cloth protruded durtal examined him as he marched toward the altar he was tall but not well built his bulging chest being out of proportion to the rest of his body his peeled forehead made one continuous line with his straight nose the lips and cheeks bristled with that kind of hard clumpy beard which old priests have who have always shaved themselves the features were round and insinuating the eyes like apple pips close together phosphorescent as a whole his face was evil and sly but energetic and the hard fixed eyes were not the furtive shifty orbs that durtal had imagined the canon solemnly knelt before the altar then mounted the steps and began to say mass durtal saw then that he had nothing on beneath his sacrificial habit his black socks and his flesh bulging over the garters attached high up in his legs were plainly visible the chasuble had the shape of an ordinary chasuble 
but was of the dark red colour of dried blood and in the middle in a triangle around which was an embroidered border of colchicum savin sorrel and spurge was the figure of a black billy goat presenting his horns docre made the genuflections the full or half-length inclinations specified by the ritual the kneeling choir boys sang the latin responses in a crystalline voice which trilled on the ultimate syllables of the words but it's a simple low mass said durtal to madame chantelouve she shook her head indeed at that moment the choir boys passed behind the altar and one of them brought back copper chafing dishes the other censers which they distributed to the congregation all the women enveloped themselves in the smoke some held their heads right over the chafing dishes and inhaled deeply then fainting unlaced themselves heaving raucous sighs the sacrifice ceased the priest descended the steps backward knelt on the last one and in a sharp trippidant voice cried master of slanders dispenser of the benefits of crime administrator of sumptuous sins and great vices satan thee we adore reasonable god just god super admirable legate of false trances thou receivest our beseeching tears thou savest the honour of families by aborting wombs impregnated in the forgetfulness of the good orgasm thou dost suggest to the mother the hastening of untimely birth and thine obstetrics spares the stillborn children the anguish of maturity the contamination of original sin mainstay of the despairing poor cordial of the vanquished it is thou who endowest them with hypocrisy ingratitude and stiff-neckedness that they may defend themselves against the children of god the rich suzerain of resentment accountant of humiliations treasurer of old hatreds thou alone dost fertilize the brain of man whom injustice has crushed thou breathest into him the idea of meditated vengeance sure misdeeds thou incitest him to murder thou givest him the abundant joy of accomplished reprisals and permittest him to taste the intoxicating draught of the tears of which he is the cause hope of virility anguish of the empty womb thou dost not demand the bootless offering of chaste loins thou dost not sing the praises of lenten follies thou alone receivest the carnal supplications and petitions of poor and avaricious families thou determinest the mother to sell her daughter to give her son thou aidest sterile and reprobate loves guardian of strident neuroses leaden tower of hysteria bloody vase of rape master thy faithful servants on their knees implore thee and supplicate thee to satisfy them when they wish the torture of all those who love them and aid them they supplicate thee to assure them the joy of delectable misdeeds unknown to justice spells whose unknown origin baffles the reason of man they ask finally glory riches power of thee king of the disinherited son who art to overthrow the inexorable father then docre rose and erect with arms outstretched vociferated in a ringing voice of hate and thou thou whom in my quality of priest i force whether thou wilt or no to descend into this host to incarnate thyself in this bread jesus artisan of hoaxes bandit of homage robber of affection here since the day when thou didst issue from the complacent bowels of a virgin thou hast failed all thine engagements belied all thy promises centuries have wept awaiting thee fugitive god mute god thou wast to redeem man and thou hast not thou wast to appear in thy glory and thou sleepest go lie say to the wretch who appeals to thee hope be patient suffer the hospital of souls will receive thee the angels will assist thee heaven opens to thee impostor thou knowest well that the angels disgusted at thine inertness abandon thee thou wast to be the interpreter of our plaints the chamberlain of our tears thou wast to convey them to the father and thou hast not done so for this intercession would disturb thine eternal sleep of happy satiety thou hast forgotten the poverty thou didst preach enamoured vassal of banks thou hast seen the weak crushed beneath the press of profit thou hast heard the death rattle of the timid paralyzed by famine of women disembowelled for a bit of bread and thou hast caused the chancery of thy simoniacs thy commercial representatives thy popes to answer by dilatory excuses and evasive promises sacristy shyster huckster god 
master whose inconceivable ferocity engenders life and inflicts it on the innocent whom thou darest damn in the name of what original sin whom thou darest punish by the virtue of what covenants we would have thee confess thine impudent cheats thine inexpiable crimes we would drive deeper the nails into thy hands press down the crown of thorns upon thy brow bring blood and water from the dry wounds of thy sides and that we can and will do by violating the quietude of thy body profaner of ample vices abstractor of stupid purities cursed nazarene do-nothing king coward god amen trilled the soprano voices of the choir boys durtal listened in amazement to this torrent of blasphemies and insults the foulness of the priest stupefied him a silence succeeded the litany the chapel was foggy with the smoke of the censers the women hitherto taciturn flustered now as remounting the altar the canon turned toward them and blessed them with his left hand in a sweeping gesture and suddenly the choir boys tinkled the prayer bells it was a signal the women fell to the carpet and writhed one of them seemed to be worked by a spring she threw herself prone and waved her legs in the air another suddenly struck by a hideous strabism clucked then becoming tongue-tied stood with her mouth open the tongue turned back the tip cleaving to the palate another inflated livid her pupils dilated lolled her head back over her shoulders then jerked it brusquely erect and belaboured herself tearing her breast with her nails another sprawling on her back undid her skirts drew forth a rag enormous meteorized then her face twisted into a horrible grimace and her tongue which she could not control stuck out bitten at the edges harrowed by red teeth from a bloody mouth suddenly durtal rose and now he heard and saw docre distinctly docre contemplated the christ surmounting the tabernacle and with arms spread wide apart he spewed forth frightful insults and at the end of his forces muttered the billingsgate of a drunken cabman one of the choir boys knelt before him with his back toward the altar a shudder ran around the priest's spine in a solemn but jerky voice he said hoc est enim corpus meum then instead of kneeling after the consecration before the precious body he faced the congregation and appeared tumefied haggard dripping with sweat he staggered between the two choir boys who raising the chasuble displayed his naked belly docre made a few passes and the host sailed tainted and soiled over the steps durtal felt himself shudder a whirlwind of hysteria shook the room while the choir boys sprinkled holy water on the pontiff's nakedness women rushed upon the eucharist and grovelling in front of the altar clawed from the bread humid particles and drank and ate divine ordure another woman curled up over a crucifix emitted a rending laugh then cried to docre father father a crone tore her hair leapt whirled around and around as on a pivot and fell over beside a young girl who huddled to the wall was writhing in convulsions frothing at the mouth weeping and spitting out frightful blasphemies and durtal terrified saw through the fog the red horns of docre who seated now frothing with rage was chewing up sacramental wafers taking them out of his mouth wiping himself with them and distributing them to the women who ground them underfoot howling or fell over each other struggling to get hold of them and violate them the place was simply a madhouse a monstrous pandemonium of prostitutes and maniacs now while the choir boys gave themselves to the men and while the woman who owned the chapel mounted the altar caught hold of the phallus of the christ with one hand and with the other held a chalice between his naked legs a little girl who hitherto had not budged suddenly bent over forward and howled howled like a dog overcome with disgust nearly asphyxiated durtal wanted to flee he looked for hyacinthe she was no longer at his side he finally caught sight of her close to the cannon and stepping over the writhing bodies on the floor he went to her with quivering nostrils she was inhaling the effluvia of the perfumes and of the couples the sabbatic odour she said to him between clenched teeth in a strangled voice here let's get out of this she seemed to wake hesitated a moment then without answering she followed him he elbowed his way through the crowd jostling women whose protruding teeth were ready to bite he pushed madame chantelouve to the door crossed the court traversed the vestibule and finding the portress's lodge empty he drew the cord and found himself in the street there he stopped and drew the fresh air deep into his lungs hyacinthe motionless dizzy huddled to the wall away from him he looked at her confess that you would like to go in there again 
no she said with an effort these scenes shatter me i am in a daze i must have a glass of water and she went up the street leaning on him straight to the wine shop which was open it was an ignoble lair a little room with tables and wooden benches a zinc counter cheap bar fixtures and blue stained wooden pitchers in the ceiling a u-shaped gas bracket two pick and shovel labourers were playing cards they turned around and laughed the proprietor took the excessively short-stemmed pipe from his mouth and spat into the sawdust he seemed not at all surprised to see this fashionably gowned woman in his dive durtal who was watching him thought he surprised an understanding look exchanged by the proprietor and the woman the proprietor lighted a candle and mumbled into durtal's ear monsieur you can't drink here with these people watching i'll take you to a room where you can be alone hmm said durtal to hyacinthe who was penetrating the mysteries of a spiral staircase a lot of fuss for a glass of water but she had already entered a musty room the paper was peeling from the walls which were nearly covered with pictures torn out of illustrated weeklies and tacked up with hairpins the floor was all in pieces there were a wooden bed without any curtains a chamber pot with a piece broken out of the side a wash bowl and two chairs the man brought a decanter of gin a large one of water some sugar and glasses then went downstairs her eyes were sombre mad she enlaced durtal no he shouted furious at having fallen into this trap i've had enough of that it's late your husband is waiting for you it's time for you to go back to him she did not even hear him i want you she said and she took him treacherously and obliged him to desire her she disrobed threw her skirts on the floor opened wide the abominable couch and raising her chemise in the back she rubbed her spine up and down over the coarse grain of the sheets a look of swooning ecstasy was in her eyes and a smile of joy on her lips she seized him and with ghoulish fury dragged him into obscenities of whose existence he had never dreamed suddenly when he was able to escape he shuddered for he perceived that the bed was strewn with fragments of hosts oh you fill me with horror dress and let's get out of here while with a faraway look in her eyes she was silently putting on her clothes he sat down on a chair the fetidness of the room nauseated him then too he was not absolutely convinced of transubstantiation he did not believe very firmly that the saviour resided in that soiled bread but in spite of himself the sacrilege he had involuntarily participated in saddened him suppose it were true he said to himself that the presents were real as hyacinthe and that miserable priest attest no decidedly i have had enough i am through the occasion is timely for me to break with this creature whom from our very first interview i have only tolerated and i'm going to seize the opportunity below in the dive he had to face the knowing smiles of the labourers he paid and without waiting for his change he fled they reached the rue de vaugirard and he hailed a cab as they were whirled along they sat lost in their thoughts not looking at each other soon asked madame chanteloube in an almost timid tone when he left her at her door no he answered we have nothing in common you wish everything and i wish nothing better break we might drag out our relation but it would finally terminate in recrimination and bitterness oh and then after what happened this evening no understand me no and he gave the cabman his address and huddled himself into the furthest corner of the fiacre end of chapter 19「Twenty of La Barre by Jory Karl Heismans, translated by Keen Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. He doesn't lead a humdrum life, that canon, said de Hermie, when Durtal had related to him the details of the Black Mass. It's a veritable seraglio of hysteroepileptics and erotomaniacs that he has formed for himself, but his vices lack warmth certainly in the matter of contumelious blasphemies of sacrilegious atrocities and sensual excitation this priest may seem to have exceeded the limits to be almost unique but the bloody and investuous side of the old sabbats is wanting docre is we must admit greatly inferior to gilles de Ray. his works are incomplete insipid weak if i may say so i like that 
you know it isn't easy to procure children whom one may disembowel with impunity the parents would raise a row and the police would interfere yes and it is to difficulties of this sort that we must evidently attribute the bloodless celebration of the black mass but i am thinking just now of the women you described the ones that put their heads over the chafing dishes to drink in the smoke of the burning resin they employ the procedure of the aisauas who hold their heads over the braceros whenever the catalepsy necessary to their orgies is slow in coming as for the other phenomena you cite they are known in the hospitals and except as symptoms of the demoniac influence they teach us nothing new now another thing not a word of this to carre because he would be quite capable of closing his door in your face if he knew you had been present at an office in honour of satan they went downstairs from durtal's apartment and walked along toward the tower of saint sulpice i didn't bring anything to eat because you said you would look after that said durtal but this morning i sent madame carre in lieu of desserts and wine some real dutch gingerbread and a couple of rather surprising liqueurs an elixir of life which we shall take by way of appetizer before the repast and a flask of creme de celery i have discovered an honest distiller impossible you shall see this elixir of life is manufactured from socotra aloes little cardamom saffron myrrh and a heap of other aromatics it's inhumanly bitter but it's exquisite i am anxious to taste it the least we can do is fate gevinger a little on his deliverance have you seen him yes he's looking fine we'll make him tell us all about his cure i keep wondering what he lives on on what his astrological skill brings him then there are rich people who have their horoscopes cast we must hope so to tell you the truth i think gevinger is not in very easy circumstances under the empire he was astrologer to the empress who was very superstitious and had faith as did napoleon for that matter in predictions and fortune-telling but since the fall of the empire i think gevinger's situation has changed a good deal for the worse nevertheless he passes for being the only man in france who has preserved the secrets of cornelius agrippa cremona ruggieri goric sinibald the swordsman and tritemius while discoursing they had climbed the stair and arrived at the bell-ringer's door the astrologer was already there and the table was set all grimaced a bit as they tasted the black and active liqueur which durtal poured joyous to have all her family about her mama carre brought the rich soup she filled the plates when a dish of vegetables was passed and durtal chose a leek des hermies said laughing look out porta a thaumaturge of the late sixteenth century informs us that this plant long considered an emblem of virility perturbs the quietude of the most chaste don't listen to him said the bell-ringer's wife and you monsieur gevinger some carrots durtal looked at the astrologer his head still looked like a sugar-loaf his hair was the same faded dirty brown of hydroquinine or ipecac powders his bird eyes had the same startled look his enormous hands were covered with the same phalanx of rings he had the same obsequious and imposing manner and sacerdotal tone but he was freshened up considerably the wrinkles had gone out of his skin and his eyes were brighter since his visit to lyon durtal congratulated him on the happy result of the treatment it was high time monsieur i was putting myself under the care of dr joannes for i was nearly gone not possessing a shred of the gift of voyance and knowing no extra lucid cataleptic who could inform me of the clandestine preparations of canon d'ocre i could not possibly defend myself by using the laws of countersign and of the shock in return but said des hermies admitting that you could through the intermediation of a flying spirit have been aware of the operations of the priest how could you have parried them the law of countersigns consists when you know in advance the day and hour of the attack in going away from home thus throwing the spell off the track and neutralizing it or in saying an hour beforehand here i am strike the last method is calculated to scatter the fluids to the wind and paralyze the powers of the assailant in magic any act known and made public is lost as for the shock in return one must also know beforehand of the attempt if one is to cast back the spells on the person sending them before one is struck by them i was certain to perish a day had passed since i was bewitched two days more and i should have been ready for the cemetery how's that every individual struck by magic has three days in which to take measures that time past the ill is incurable 
so when dokra announced to me that he condemned me to death by his own authority and when two hours later on returning home i felt desperately ill i lost no time packing my grip and starting for lyon and there asked durtal there i saw dr joannes i told him of dokra's threat and of my illness he said to me simply that priest can dress the most virulent poisons in the most frightful sacrileges the fight will be bitter but i shall conquer and he immediately called in a woman who lives in his house a voyant he hypnotized her and she at his injunction explained the nature of the sorcery of which i was the victim she reconstructed the scene she literally saw me being poisoned by food and drink mixed with menstrual fluid that had been reinforced with macerated sacramental wafers and drugs skilfully dosed that sort of spell is so terrible that aside from dr joannes no thaumaturge in france dare try to cure it so the doctor finally said to me your cure can be obtained only through an invincible power you must lose no time you must at once sacrifice to the glory of melchizedek he raised an altar composed of a table and a wooden tabernacle it was shaped like a little house surmounted by a cross and encircled under the pediment by the dial-like figure of the tetragram he brought the silver chalice the unleavened bread and the wine he donned his sacerdotal habits put on his finger the ring which has received the supreme benedictions then he began to read from a special missal the prayers of the sacrifice almost at once the voyant cried here are the spirits evoked for the spell these are they which have carried the venefice obedient to the command of the master of black magic canon d'ocre i was sitting beside the altar dr joannes placed his left hand on my head and raising toward heaven his right he besought the archangel michael to assist him and adjured the glorious legions of the invincible seraphim to dominate to enchain the spirits of evil i was already feeling greatly relieved the sensation of internal gnawing which tortured me in paris was diminishing dr joannes continued to recite his orisons then when the moment came for the deprecatory prayer he took my hand laid it on the altar and three times chanted may the projects and the designs of the worker of iniquity who has made enchantment against you be brought to naught may any influence obtained by satanic means any attack directed against you be null and void of effect may all the maledictions of your enemy be transformed into benedictions from the highest summits of the eternal hills may his fluids of death be transmuted into ferments of life finally may the archangels of judgment and chastisement decide the fate of the miserable priest who has put his trust in the works of darkness and evil you he said to me are delivered heaven has cured you may your heart therefore repay the living god and jesus christ through the glorious mary with the most ardent devotion he offered me unleavened bread and wine i was saved you who are a physician monsieur des Hermies, can bear witness that human science was impotent to aid me and now look at me yes des Hermies replied without discussing the means i certify the cure and i admit it is not the first time that to my knowledge similar results have been obtained no thanks to madame carré who was inviting him to take another helping from a plate of sausages with horseradish and creamed peas but said durtal permit me to ask you several questions certain details interest me what were the sacerdotal ornaments of dr joannes his costume was a long robe of vermilion cashmere caught up at the waist by a red and white sash above this robe he had a white mantle of the same stuff cut over the chest in the form of a cross upside down cross upside down yes this cross reversed like the figure of the hanged man in the old-fashioned tarot card deck signifies that the priest melchizedek must die in the old man that is man affected by original sin and live again the christ to be powerful with the power of the incarnate word which died for us Carré seemed ill at ease his fanatical and suspicious catholicism refused to countenance any save the prescribed ceremonies he made no further contribution to the conversation and in significant silence filled the glasses seasoned the salad and passed the plates what sort of a ring was that you spoke of it is a symbolic ring of pure gold it has the image of a serpent whose head in relief set with a ruby is connected by a fine chain with a tiny circlet which fastens the jaws of the reptile 
what i should like awfully to know is the origin and the aim of this sacrifice what has melchizedek to do with your affair ah said the astrologer melchizedek is one of the most mysterious of all the figures in the holy bible he was king of salem sacrificer to the most high god he blessed abraham and abraham gave him tithes of the spoil of the vanquished kings of sodom and gomorrah that is the story in genesis fourteen eighteen to twenty but saint paul cites him also in hebrews seven and in the third verse of that chapter says that melchizedek without father without mother without descent having neither beginning of day nor end of life but made like unto the son of god abideth a priest continually in hebrews five six paul quoting psalm one hundred and ten four says jesus is called a priest forever after the order of melchizedek all this you see is obscure enough some exegetes recognize in him the prophetic figure of the saviour others that of saint joseph and all admit that the sacrifice of melchizedek offering to abraham the blood and wine of which he had first made oblation to the lord prefigures to follow the expression of isidore of damietta the archetype of the divine mysteries otherwise known as the holy mass very well said de Hermie, but all that scripture does not explain the alexipharmical virtues which dr joannes attributes to the sacrifice you are asking more than i can answer only dr joannes could tell you this much i can say theology teaches us that the mass as it is celebrated is the reenaction of the sacrifice of calvary but the sacrifice to the glory of melchizedek is not that it is in some sort the future mass the glorious office which will be known during the earthly reign of the divine paraclete this sacrifice is offered to god by man regenerated redeemed by the infusion of the love of the holy ghost now the hominal being whose heart has thus been purified and sanctified is invincible and the enchantments of hell cannot prevail against him if he makes use of this sacrifice to dissipate the spirits of evil that explains to you the potency of dr joannes whose heart unites in this ceremony with the divine heart of jesus your exposition is not very clear carré mildly objected then it must be supposed that joannes is a man amended ahead of time an apostle animated by the holy ghost and so he is said the astrologer firmly assured will you please pass the gingerbread carre requested here's the way to fix it said durtal first cut a slice very thin then take a slice of ordinary bread equally thin butter them and put them together now tell me if this sandwich hasn't the exquisite taste of fresh walnuts well said de Hermy, pursuing his cross-examination aside from that what has dr joannes been doing in this long time since i last saw him he leads what ought to be a peaceful life he lives with friends who revere and adore him with them he rests from the tribulations of all sorts save one that he has been subjected to he would be perfectly happy if he did not have to repulse the attacks launched at him almost daily by the tonsured magicians of rome why do they attack him a thorough explanation would take a long time joannes is commissioned by heaven to break up the venomous practices of satanism and to preach the coming of the glorified christ and the divine paraclete now the diabolical curia which holds the vatican in its clutches has every reason of self-interest for putting out of the way a man whose prayers fetter their conjurements and neutralize their spells ah exclaimed durtal and would it be too much to ask you how this former priest foresees and checks these astonishing assaults no indeed the doctor can tell by the flight and cry of certain birds falcons and male sparrow-hawks are his sentinels if they fly toward him or away from him to east or west whether they emit a single cry or many these are omens letting him know the hour of the combat so that he can be on guard thus he told me one day the sparrow-hawks are easily influenced by the spirits and he uses them as the hypnotist makes use of somnambulism as the spiritist makes use of tables and slates they are the telegraph wires for magic despatches yes and of course you know that the method is not new indeed its origin is lost in the darkness of the ages ornithomancy is world old one finds traces of it in the holy bible and the zohar asserts that one may receive numerous notifications if one knows how to observe the flight and distinguish the cries of birds but said durtal why is the sparrow-hawk chosen in preference to other birds well it has always been since remotest antiquity the harbinger of charms 
in egypt the god with the head of a hawk was the one who possessed the science of the hieroglyphics formerly in that country the hierogrammatists swallowed the heart and blood of the hawk to prepare themselves for the magic rites even today african chiefs put a hawk feather in their hair and this bird is sacred in india how does your friend go about it asked madame carré raising and housing birds of prey because that is what they are he does not raise them nor house them they nest in the high bluffs along the saone near lyon they come and see him in time of need durtal looking around this cosy dining-room and recalling the extraordinary conversations which had been held here was thinking how far we are from the language and the ideas of modern times all that takes us back to the middle ages he said finishing his thought aloud happily exclaimed carre who was rising to go and ring his bells yes said des hermies and what is mighty strange in this day of crass materialism is the idea of battles fought in space over the cities between a priest of lyon and prelates of rome and between this priest and the rosicrucians and canon d'ocre durtal remembered that madame chanteloube had assured him that the chiefs of the rosicrucians were making frantic efforts to establish connections with the devil and prepare spells you think that the rosicrucians are satanizing they would like to but they don't know how they are limited to reproducing mechanically the few fluidic and veniniferous operations revealed to them by the three brahmins who visited paris a few years ago i am thankful myself said madame carre as she took leave of the company that i am not mixed up in any of this frightful business and that i can pray and live in peace then while des hermies as usual prepared the coffee and durtal brought the liqueur glasses gévinger filled his pipe and when the sound of the bells died away dispersed and as if absorbed by the pores of the wall he blew out a great cloud of smoke and said i passed some delightful days with the family with whom dr joannes is living after the shocks which i had received it was a privilege without equal to complete my convalescence in that sweet atmosphere of christian love and too joannes is of all men i have ever met the most learned in the occult sciences no one except his antithesis the abominable d'ocre has penetrated so far into the arcana of satanism one may even say that in france these two are the only ones who have crossed the terrestrial threshold and obtained each in his field sure results but in addition to the charm of his conversation and the scope of his knowledge for even on the subject in which i excel that of astrology he surprised me joannes delighted me with the beauty of his vision of the future transformation of peoples he is really i swear the prophet whose earthly mission of suffering and glory has been authorized by the most high i don't doubt it said durtal smiling but his theory of the paraclete is if i am not mistaken the very ancient heresy of montanus which the church has formally condemned all depends on the manner in which the coming of the paraclete is conceived interjected the bell-ringer returning at that moment it is also the orthodox doctrine of saint irenaeus saint justin scotus erigena amaury of chartres saint doucine and that admirable mystic joachim of floris this was the belief throughout the middle ages and i admit that it obsesses me and fills me with joy that it responds to the most ardent of my yearnings indeed he said sitting down and crossing his legs if the third kingdom is an illusion what consolation is left for christians in face of the general disintegration of a world which charity requires us not to hate i am furthermore obliged to admit said des hermies that in spite of the bloodshed on golgotha i personally feel as if my ransom had not been quite effected there are three kingdoms the astrologer resumed pressing down the ashes of his pipe with his finger of the old testament that of the father the kingdom of fear of the new testament that of the son the kingdom of expiation of the joannite gospel that of the holy ghost the kingdom of redemption and love they are the past present and future winter spring and summer the first says joachim of floris gives us the blade the second the leaf and the third the ear two of the persons of the trinity have shown themselves logically the third must appear yes and the biblical texts abound conclusive explicit irrefutable said carre all the prophets isaiah ezekiel daniel zachariah malachi speak of it the acts of the apostles is very precise on this point in the first chapter you will read these lines this same jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven 
st john also announces the tidings in the apocalypse which is the gospel of the second coming of christ christ shall come and reign a thousand years st paul is inexhaustible in revelations of this nature in the epistle to timothy he invokes the lord who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearance and his kingdom in the second epistle to the thessalonians he writes and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming now he declares that the antichrist is not yet so the coming which he prophesies is not that already realized by the birth of the saviour at bethlehem in the gospel according to st matthew jesus responds to caiaphas who asks him if he is the christ son of god thou hast said and nevertheless i say unto you hereafter shall ye see the son of man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven and in another verse he says to his apostles watch therefore for ye know not what hour your lord doth come and there are other texts i could put my finger on no there is no use in talking the partisans of the glorious kingdom are supported with certitude by inspired passages and can under certain conditions and without fear of heresy uphold this doctrine which st jerome attests was in the fourth century a dogma of faith recognized by all but what say we taste a bit of this creme de celery which m durtal praises so highly it was a thick liqueur syrupy like anisette but even sweeter and more feminine only when one had swallowed this inert semi-liquid there lingered in the roots of the papillae a faint taste of celery it isn't bad said the astrologer but there's no life to it and he poured into his glass a stiff tot of rum come to think of it said durtal the third kingdom is also announced in the words of the paternoster thy kingdom come certainly said the bell ringer but you see interjected gévinger heresy would gain the upper hand and the whole belief would be turned into nonsense and absurdity if we admitted as certain paracletists do an authentic fleshly incarnation for instance remember farenism which has been rife since the eighteenth century in farin a village of the doubs where jansenism took refuge when driven out of paris after the closing of the cemetery of saint medard there a priest francois bonjour reproduced the convulsionist orgies which under the regency desecrated the tomb of deacon paris then bonjour had an affair with a woman and she claimed to be big with the prophet elijah who according to the apocalypse is to precede the last arrival of christ this child came into the world then there was a second who was none other than the paraclete the latter did business as a woolen merchant in paris was a colonel in the national guard under louis philippe and died in easy circumstances in eighteen sixty six a tradesman paraclete a redeemer with epaulettes and gold braid in eighteen eighty six one dame brochard of vouvray affirmed to whoever would listen that jesus was reincarnate in her in eighteen eighty nine a pious madman named davy published at angers a brochure entitled the voice of god in which he assumed the modest appellation of only messiah of the creator holy ghost and informed the world that he was a sewer contractor and wore a beard a yard and a half long at the present moment his throne is not empty for want of successors an engineer named pierre jean rode all over the mediterranean provinces on horseback announcing that he was the holy ghost in paris berard an omnibus conductor on the pantheon courcel line likewise asserts that he incorporates the paraclete while a magazine article avers that the hope of redemption has dawned in the person of the poet Jounet. finally in america from time to time women claim to be messiahs and they recruit adherents among persons worked up to fever pitch by advent revivals they are no worse than the people who deny god and creation said carre god is immanent in his creatures he is their life principle the source of movement the foundation of existence says st paul he has his personal existence being the i am as moses says the holy ghost through christ in glory will be immanent in all beings he will be the principle which transforms and regenerates them but there is no need for him to be incarnate the holy ghost proceeds from the father through the son he is sent to act not to materialize himself it is downright madness to maintain the contrary thus falling into the heresies of the gnostics and the fratricelli into the errors of the du saint de novart and his wife marguerite into the filth of the abbe beccarelli and the abominations of segarelli of parma who on the pretext of becoming a child the better to symbolize the simple naif love of the paraclete had himself diaped and slept on the breast of a nurse 
but said durtal you haven't made yourself quite clear to me if i understand you the holy ghost will act by an infusion into us he will transmute us renovate our souls by a sort of passive purgation to drop into the theological vernacular yes he will purify us soul and body how will he purify our bodies the action of the paraclete the astrologer struck in will extend to the principle of generation the divine life will sanctify the organs which henceforth can procreate only elect creatures exempt from original sin creatures whom it will not be necessary to test in the fires of humiliation as the holy bible says this was the doctrine of the prophet vintras that extraordinary unlettered man who wrote such impressive and ardent pages the doctrine has been continued and amplified since vintras's death by his successor dr Joannes then there is to be paradise on earth said des hermies yes the kingdom of liberty goodness and love you've got me all mixed up said durtal now you announce the arrival of the holy ghost now the glorious advent of christ are these kingdoms identical or is one to follow the other there is a distinction answered gévinger between the coming of the paraclete and the victorious return of christ they occur in the order named first a society must be recreated embraced by the third hypostasis by love in order that jesus may descend as he has promised from the clouds and reign over the people formed in his image what role is the pope to play ah that is one of the most curious points of the joannite doctrine time since the first appearance of the messiah is divided as you know into two periods the period of the victim of the expiant saviour the period in which we now are and the other that which we await the period of christ bathed in the spittle of mockery but radiant with the super adorable splendor of his person well there is a different pope for each of these eras the scriptures announce these two sovereign pontificates and so do my horoscopes for that matter it is an axiom of theology that the spirit of peter lives in his successors it will live in them more or less hidden until the longed-for expansion of the holy ghost then john who has been held in reserve as the gospel says will begin his ministry of love and will live in the souls of the new popes i don't understand the utility of a pope when jesus is to be visible said des hermies to tell the truth there is no use in having one and the papacy is to exist only during the epoch reserved for the effluence of the divine paraclete the day on which in a shower of meteors jesus appears the pontificate of rome ceases without going more deeply into questions which we could discuss the rest of our lives said durtal i marvel at the placidity of the utopian who imagines that man is perfectible there is no denying that the human creature is born selfish abusive vile just look around you and see society cynical and ferocious the humble heckled and pillaged by the rich traffickers in necessities everywhere the triumph of the mediocre and unscrupulous everywhere the apotheosis of crooked politics and finance and you think you can make any progress against a stream like that no man has never changed his soul was corrupt in the days of genesis and is not less rotten at present only the form of his sins varies progress is the hypocrisy which refines the vices all the more reason carré rejoined why society if it is as you have described it should fall to pieces i too think it is putrefied its bones ulcerated its flesh dropping off it can neither be poulticed nor cured it must be interred and a new one born and who but god can accomplish such a miracle if we admit said des hermies that the infamousness of the times is transitory it is self-evident that only the intervention of a god can wash it away for neither socialism nor any other chimera of the ignorant and hate-filled workers will modify human nature and reform the peoples these tasks are above human forces and the time awaited by joannes is at hand gévinger proclaimed here are some of the manifest proofs raymond lully asserted that the end of the old world would be announced by the diffusion of the doctrines of antichrist he defined these doctrines they are materialism and the monstrous revival of magic this prediction applies to our age i think on the other hand the good tidings was to be realized according to our lord as reported by saint matthew when ye shall see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place and isn't it standing in the holy place now look at our timorous sceptical pope lukewarm and politic our episcopate of simonists and cowards our flabby indulgent clergy 
see how they are ravaged by satanism then tell me if the church can fall any lower the promises are explicit and cannot fail and with his elbows on the table his chin in his hands and his eyes to heaven the bell ringer murmured our father thy kingdom come it's getting late said des hermies time we were going while they were putting on their coats carre questioned durtal what do you hope for if you have no faith in the coming of christ i hope for nothing at all i pity you really you believe in no future amelioration i believe alas that a dotard heaven maunders over an exhausted earth the bell ringer raised his hands and sadly shook his head when they had left gevinger des hermies after walking in silence for some time said you are not astonished that all the events spoken of to-night happened at lyon and as durtal looked at him inquiringly he continued you see i am well acquainted with lyon people's brains there are as foggy as the streets when the morning mists roll up from the rhone that city looks magnificent to travellers who like the long avenues wide boulevards green grass and penitentiary architecture of modern cities but lyon is also the refuge of mysticism the haven of preternatural ideas and doubtful creeds that's where vintras died the one in whom it seems the soul of the prophet elijah was incarnate that's where Nondorf found his last partisans that is where enchantment is rampant because in the suburb of la guillotiere you can have a person bewitched for a louis add that it is likewise in spite of its swarms of radicals and anarchists an opulent market for a dour protestant catholicism a jansenist factory richly productive of bourgeois bigotry lyon is celebrated for delicatessen silk and churches at the top of every hill and there's a hill every block is a chapel or a convent and notre dame de fourvière dominates them all from a distance this pile looks like an eighteenth century dresser turned upside down but the interior which is in process of completion is amazing you ought to go and take a look at it some day you'll see the most extraordinary jumble of assyrian roman gothic and god knows what jacked together by bosson the only architect for a century who has known how to create a cathedral interior the nave glitters with inlays and marble with bronze and gold statues of angels diversify the rows of columns and break up with impressive grace the known harmonies of line it's asiatic and barbarous and reminds one of the architecture shown in gustave moreau's Herodiade. and there is an endless stream of pilgrims they strike bargains with our lady they pray for an extension of markets new outlets for sausages and silks they consult her on ways and means of getting rid of spoiled vegetables and pushing off their shoddy in the centre of the city in the church of saint boniface i found a placard requesting the faithful out of respect for the holy place not to give alms it was not seemly you see that the commercial orisons be disturbed by the ridiculous plaints of the indigent well said durtal it's a strange thing but democracy is the most implacable of the enemies of the poor the revolution which you would think ought to have protected them proved for them the most cruel of regimes i will show you some day a decree of the year two pronouncing penalties not only for those who begged but for those who gave and yet democracy is the panacea which is going to cure every ill said des hermies laughing and he pointed to enormous posters everywhere in which general boulanger peremptorily demanded that the people of paris vote for him in the coming election durtal shrugged his shoulders quite true the people are very sick Carré and Gévinger are perhaps right in maintaining that no human agency is powerful enough to effect a cure. End of chapter 20